Well, what, what is the Andalusian problem? Spain was under Islamic rule for 800 years. One of the greatest mosques ever built overlooks the city of Cordoba. A golden age in Spain's history. It's called the myth of the Andalusian paradise. For the far right Vox party, Spain's Muslim past and present pose a danger. De una parte de la izquierda española que una vez más demuestra su odio y su desprecio a nuestra patria. The majority of Andalusians do not share these views, but they are becoming more mainstream. Spain has more than a million Muslims, and most of that growth comes from migration. It would mean that the propaganda has worked. People are scared. I when Muslims were tolerant. Let me tell you a story. Well, this is a very important topic area. This is by Dr. Dario Fernandez Morera. Some of the liberal scholars are harkening back to the so-called golden age. Burning destroyed churches. Burning destroyed cities. Cities torn down. Women taken as sex slaves. They had to pay this dizzy attack. So 7-Eleven. So think of 9-11. Think of 9-11. <laughs> Imagine yourself here one warm summer night in 7-Eleven. The streets are empty. Two guards patrol the ramparts. You see their spears silhouetted against the red glow of the campfires from the other side. It's weirdly quiet. Suddenly there's a roar of a hundred voices. An attack. The guards are running. You start running too. You must get home. Now they're screaming. It's getting louder. They're in the city. You throw yourself into an alley and hide. There is a war being fought over the city, over what it represents. It's been raging for 800 years. And right now, it's fiercer than ever. We can't ignore it any longer. So, if you're ready, we're gonna join it. Welcome to the war. Welcome to Cordoba. This is the Cathedral of Córdoba, and it is stunning. Truly one of the wonders of the early medieval world. And I'm not going to show it to you. What I will show you is what's going on right over here. Yep, it's a hole. A seriously controversial hole. They're looking for a church, the Basilica of San Vicente. Why? because the Cabildo Catedral de Córdoba, the Catholic Church here in Córdoba, is desperate to prove that before this building was built in the 8th century, there was an even older Christian basilica on this site. And that's important because before this building was a cathedral, it was a mosque, the finest in the Western Islamic world. Ah, that's awkward. But that's why it's so important that the church finds San Vicente. In a sense, it would legitimize the church's possession of this ex-mosque. And it would symbolize Christianity's historical superiority and right of possession by antedating and conquering Islamic Spain. Now, most Spaniards don't think like that, by the way. And these days, the Catholic Church is striving for interfaith dialogue, not conflict, but there are those who would have it different. The far right is growing here as it is everywhere, and with that comes racism and Islamophobia, poisoning not just our politics and our society, but our history. They are few, but they are loud, and they are growing, and wow do they love revisionist history. Their aim is to discredit the medieval inhabitants of this land, Andalusia, 
and reduce 700 years of Spanish history into a single glorious crusade against Islam, a crusade they believe they are still fighting. My aim is to tell the story of one city across a thousand years and hopefully in the process reveal those so-called revisionist historians for what they are, scared, manipulative bigots. History is the search for understanding, for rational, unbiased truth. But that's an ideal, and we're only human. History will always be viewed through a slightly tainted lens. That said, I have nailed my colors to the mast. You know where I stand. Now that that's out of the way, time for some history. Rome is falling. In 376, the empire's Danube frontier was breached by a massive migration of peoples, mostly Goths, fleeing from unstoppable Hunnic hordes on the western warpath. They spread across the empire, raiding, settling, fighting both with and against the Romans, who, in time, came to rely on these so-called barbarians to fill and lead its army. Yet corruption, racism, and infighting endemic in the Roman hierarchy prevented these people from ever fully assimilating. They maintained their own sense of cultural identity, an identity increasingly at odds with the struggling Roman state. Across Europe, these nascent Germanic nations asserted their independence, all hungry to take a bite out of the dying Roman beast. Bit by bit, the Western Roman court ceded territory. The Western Goths, Visigoths, settled in southern Gaul and in the east and south of the Iberian Peninsula, whilst the Swabi established themselves in the west. By 476, when the line of recognised Western Roman emperors was permanently severed, Europe was a patchwork of independent kingdoms. The board was set, a new game had begun in Europe, the medieval age. Rome was dead in the west. In the east, it was alive and well. From the thriving city of New Rome, Constantinople, the ambitious emperor Justinian I orchestrated the empire's comeback. In the 550s, the southeastern coast of Spain was restored as a Roman province in the empire. Cordoba was on the edge of that province, called Spania, and nominally fell under Roman jurisdiction, or Byzantine jurisdiction, as we refer to the Eastern Roman Empire in this period. To the north was Gothic territory, the kingdom of the Visigoths. In the post-Rome free-for-all, the Goths had fought the Franks, the Suebi, the Alans, the Vandals, and the Romans to carve out their new kingdom, which they based in Toledo, near modern-day Madrid. They attacked Cordoba in 549. They were crushed, but never the type to give up. 20 years later, they tried again, and this time, Cordoba fell. After 700 years, the Roman chapter of Cordoba's story was over. In a sense, you see, despite the whole sacking Rome thing, the Goths saw themselves as heirs to the Roman legacy. They were Latinized, Christianized, they dressed like Romans, they spoke like Romans, and the social landscape of Spain remained largely unchanged. There was still a peasant class under a wealthy civil landowning class, only now there was a new class above them, the warrior nobility of Gothic aristocracy, who took Roman titles like ducks and commis. And above them, there was the king. In the sixth century, after a bit of a shaky start, the Visigoths got their act together. The kingdom of the Suebi was annexed, unifying the peninsula. Goths and Hispano-Romans intermarried, and in 587, the Aryan Goths converted to Catholicism. It was all coming together for Spain, but it wasn't going to last. On the other side of the Mediterranean, Rome and Persia were hacking each other's armies apart, and plague was choking life and prosperity from cities, towns and hamlets. But deep in the unremarkable desert of the Arabian Peninsula, the remarkable was happening. The Arabian tribes were uniting, organizing, inspired by one who was said to have been touched by angels. God had summoned his chosen people, and they spread across the land, conquering by the word or by the sword, and empires trembled. The world had entered a new era, and it belonged to the Arabs. 
Everybody should be taught about the birth of Islam. Like the Roman Jewish Wars or the Massacre of Thessalonica, it's one of those historical events that explain so much as to why our world is how it is. All right, let me just say, I'll be taking the point of view that God does not exist and that humans are the only agents determining the course of history. This does not reflect the belief at the time, nor of course of many today. But I'm not interested in disputing or disproving anything. This is just how I approach history. Historically speaking, therefore, Muhammad was a genius. By the time he died in 632, he had done the impossible. The Arab tribes were under one leadership and one religion. Neither the Romans nor the Persians saw this coming. They could do little to stop city after city falling to the Arabs. Not that the Arabs had a hard time taking them. A show of force or a compelling letter was often all that was needed. When resisted, however, violence would ensue. This goes without saying, that is what conquest entails. Anytime, anywhere. Conflict was simply a staple of these times, and neither the Romans nor the Persians saw this as a religious war. Islam didn't just emerge from the desert fully formed, it developed gradually. The Romans considered it just another heretical sect of Christianity, and nobody could have foreseen the Arabs' aptitude in turning conquest into consolidation. These were no tribal raiders. These were empire builders. Equipped with both the means and the motivation, the Arabs set about forging an empire. Their horsemen rode east into the ancient realm of the Persians, across the Hindu Kush in the footsteps of Macedonian phalanxes. Marching west, soldiers rested in the shadow of the Great Pyramids, tore down the walls of Carthage, finally reaching the edge of the world on the shores of the Atlantic. Only an ocean could oppose them. So challenged, the conqueror raises his sword and charges into the surf, crying aloud, O oh God, if the sea had not prevented me, I would have galloped on forever like Alexander the Great, upholding your faith and fighting the unbelievers. In 711, a small force crossed the Straits of Gibraltar and entered the kingdom of the Visigoths. The Arabs were in Europe. And opposing them was nobody. So they set about plundering, looting, and easily crushing what little localized resistance they met. What's going on here? Where were the mighty Gothic nobles, the proud warriors who once brought Rome to her knees? Well, as aspiring as I may have made the Visigoth kingdom sound, I'd hate for you to get the wrong idea. They may have seen themselves as heirs to the Roman Empire, but Visigoth Spain was a far cry from Imperial Hispania. The cities were depopulated and destitute. The vast agricultural estates were abandoned. Spain was a great swathe of uninhabited, uncultivated land dotted with small walled settlements surviving off subsistence agriculture. There was one Gothic army, the Royal Army, which was a seasonal force consisting of farmer soldiers called to service by their local lord upon summons from the king. This was the beginning of feudalism. And you know what? It worked. In a closed system, where all your neighbours were playing by the same rules, it was a stable mechanism of political and social organisation. Unfortunately for the Visigoths, the Arabs weren't playing by the same rules. The Caliphate combined the resources of an empire with the dissemination of military power into the hands of semi-autonomous generals with the mandate to go forth and conquer. Two very different states playing very different games. Two different systems of social and military organisation operating under two very different parameters. Despite what some would have you believe, nobody, nobody is suggesting that Visigoth Spain was an inherently inferior civilization. It was optimised for the environment it existed in. 
unexpected external invasion by a rapidly expanding empire was not part of that environment. And so the Gothic Kingdom was not equipped to resist it. None of the European kingdoms were. But that doesn't mean they didn't try. Under a blazing July sun, not far from Cadiz, King Roderick met the invaders in battle. The Gothic army outnumbered the invaders and the Spanish shield wall held strong. But unknown to Roderick, treachery and betrayal had infiltrated the camp. On the third day, the exhausted eastern invaders launched an all-out cavalry charge, a last ditch effort to rout the Spaniards from the field. 10,000 hooves thundered across the plain. The Spanish braced shoulder to shoulder, planting the ends of their long spears into the baked dirt. This is it. Suddenly, without reason, the right flank breaks ranks and retreats. Exposed, confused, panic strikes as the Arab cavalry smash through shields and limbs. The king's standard disappears in a mess of mangled bodies and maddened horses. First a rout, then a massacre. Nobody knows why the Goths were so soundly defeated or how long the battle actually lasted. I made up the cavalry charge in the three days thing for a dramatic effect. The treachery, I didn't make up though. That comes from Arab sources. They claim that the disenfranchised brothers of the previous Gothic king undermined Roderick on the field of battle, presumably planning to seize power when the invaders left with their loot. But the invaders had other ideas, which brings us back to where we started and the attack on Cordoba in 711. The Arabs had been told by a shepherd that most of the population had fled, but that the governor remained with 400 militia. The Arab general dispatched a small force of 300 riders to take the city, probably expecting the ill-equipped garrison to just surrender. They arrived to a sorry site. The Roman bridge was in ruins and there was a huge hole in the ramparts, probably hastily barricaded with rubble and dirt. The invaders easily breached the walls. The defenders retreated to a church where they held out for three months. The sources don't name it, but it must have been a, an impressive church to withstand a siege for three months. The reason I bring that up is because news from the Mesquita dig is that the archaeologists have just discovered the largest Episcopal palace in all of Spain. That's what the headlines are saying anyway. But there's something there, and it's big. And I can't help wondering, what if that's where the defenders made their last stand? Imagine how certain people with certain agendas would see that. The humble San Vicente turns out not only to be the magnificent Episcopal Palace, but also the site of a heroic last stand against the heathen invaders. Did I mention they were all executed after? Well, there's a word for that. And that's where things get complicated. With nobody to stand in their way, Spain fell to its new conquerors. Like so many before them, they gazed across the vast plains and lush river valleys, the imposing snow-sprinkled mountains, and were filled with ambition. It's the ruins of those who came before, Romans, Carthaginians, Celts, Greeks, Goths, a new Spain was born, Al-Andalus, and at its heart, restored with new life and purpose, the city at the center of it all, Cordoba, the ornament of the world. So you're here, sometime after the Arab conquest. You've just seen your city fall into the hands of these foreign invaders, and you're probably expecting the worst. Looting, violence, death. But it doesn't come. You hear that the soldiers in the church have surrendered. You hear that they've all been executed. But that's it? What sort of conquest is this? Don't get me wrong, I'm sure there was some unsanctioned looting, but the Arab armies followed certain rules of conquest. If I, as a noble, submitted to the Arab generals without resistance, my lands and my property would remain mine and off limits to pillaging and looting. Many Gothic nobles and lords took this offer, maintaining their status and their lands. It was a no-brainer. 
considering which way the wind was blowing, and it prevented suffering and destruction. So, as you walk around the city, everything seems relatively normal, better even. The Roman bridge has been repaired, the walls patched up, and you get the feeling that there are more Jews about than usual, or maybe they just seem more. For as many Christians fled from the Arabs, the Jews stayed put. By the time the Arabs reached Toledo, only the Jewish community remained. Maybe they were aware of the protected status of Jews in the Caliphate, or maybe they just believed things couldn't possibly be worse under the Arabs than they were under the Goths. You see, Jews, like Christians, were given the same protected status in Islamic law as people of the book. Why? Social cohesion. Although Arabs were the new power in the land, they were a significant minority. And the only way they were going to keep that power is by keeping the majority Jews and Christians happy. Of course, they could have just killed them all, but that wouldn't leave much of an empire to rule. Hence, the importance of social cohesion. Patriarch, do you know why I did not pray inside the church? I do not know, Commander of the Faithful. If I had prayed inside the church, you would be losing it, and it would have gone from your hands because, after my death, the Muslims would seize it, saying, Umar has prayed here. But give me a piece of parchment to write for you a document. And Umar wrote a document for the sake of the Patriarch, that the Muslims should not pray in this place, except individually, the one after the other, nor congregate here for the purpose of praying, nor should they be called by the voice of a caller for prayer, and that no form of this document should be altered. That's Eutychius describing the meeting between Caliph Umar ibn al-Khattab and Sophronius, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, after he had surrendered the city to the Arabs. It's probably made up, but the process that it describes certainly isn't, creating social cohesion in a multi-religious society. This Caliph is credited with writing the Pact of Umar, a treaty guaranteeing the rights of Jews and Christians in the Caliphate. They became dhimmi, protected people. Their religious freedom was guaranteed, but limited. They were accepted into Arab society, but couldn't dress like Arabs or take Arab names, which didn't last long. And whilst dhimmi could rise to prominent civil or military positions, they would always be what we would call second-class citizens. This pact is sometimes idealised as the epitome of religious tolerance, and in a sense, it was, if by tolerance you mean compromise in a less than ideal situation for everyone involved. Of course, the Christians weren't happy living in a non-Christian state, but that state had failed to protect them, and this pact at least allowed them to keep their livelihoods, their home, and their God. Nor was it ideal for the Arabs having this huge population of potentially rebellious non-believers in what should have been one empire under one God. The pact wasn't peace and love, man. It was plain, simple necessity. And it more or less worked. There was one positive to having a bunch of dhimmi in your empire, though. And this is where certain revisionists start foaming at the mouth, because dhimmi get this, had to pay tax. Jizya was an annual levy on all adult male dhimmi who weren't either poor soldiers or monks. It was proportionate to one's wealth and really it wasn't that much. What angers people like Dario Fernandez Moreira, author of The Myth of the Andalusian Paradise, is that aside from Muslims not having to pay it, the jizya was apparently an annual ritual of humiliation. According to him, every dhimmi would come before the tax collector who was sitting on a throne. Of course he was. He would then choke the dhimmi whilst reciting, O oh, dhimmi, enemy of Allah, pay the jizya that you owe us for the protection and tolerance we grant you. And then all the other Arabs in attendance would take their turn to do the same. Like, not only is that completely made up, but K-1 
can you imagine how long it would take to collect all the taxes that way? It's utterly ridiculous, not least because the tax collectors themselves could sometimes be a dimmy. In this case, it's funny. Fernandez Moreira paints an image that's comical because it's so obviously implausible. But the intent is far from funny. Close reading is where you take a text and only consider the words without considering the historical context, the author's motives, the audience, anything that would lead to a more rounded interpretation or understanding. Combine that with very narrow selection of texts and only those that confirm your point of view. And you very quickly go from, look at what this tax collector was doing in 9th century Spain to Muslims are trying to rewrite our history and we must fight back. And that's what's at stake here. The manipulation of history to serve an extreme historical and political agenda. In the western regions there shone a fair ornament of the world, an august city, proud as a result of its newfound military might. A city that had been founded by Spanish settlers and was known by the famous name of Cordoba. A wealthy city, renowned for its charms, splendid in all of its resources, overflowing in particular in the seven streams of knowledge, and ever noted for its continual victories. So wrote Roswitha, a nun living in far off Saxony in the mid 10th century. She heard all about the glittering city at the center of the world when an embassy from Cordoba visited the court of the Holy Roman Emperor, Otto I, in 955. Roswitha had either met the Cordoban ambassador in person or had met someone who had met him. Him being secretary to the Caliph, Rabbi Ibn Sid al Yusuf, better known as Reismund, the Bishop of Elvira. Wait, what? All right, a few things to unpack here. Firstly, Cordoba, by this stage, was no longer part of the Caliphate. It was the Caliphate. The young Emir Abd al-Rahman declared Cordoba's independence from Baghdad in 929, ending the two centuries of lip service paid to the ruling Abbasids in the East. Secondly, yes, the Caliph's ambassador to the German court was a Christian. It was not unusual for Dimi to hold high office in the Caliphate of Cordoba. Reismund served loyally as Abd al-Rahman's foreign dignitary, representing the Caliph in Constantinople and Jerusalem, and being honoured by the Caliph for his service with the See of Elvira. And thirdly, no, Roswitha was not impressed. She wrote with all the fury of one who rued the day when such a holy city as Cordoba fell to the hands of the heretics. And yet, despite being a thousand miles away, and comprehending little of Cordoba's complex society, a, a bishop serving a heretic king. Her writings do betray a hint of what was going on in that faraway city. And what was going on was prosperity. As you walk through the bustling markets, you catch words of victories against the northern kingdoms. Things hadn't been so good for Cordoba in the past decades, but the strong leadership of Abd al-Rahman had ushered in a golden age. Before you can reach the gate, you're stopped by rows of guards. A magnificent troop of horses and soldiers are entering the city. Silks and armor gleaming in the sun. Romans. A diplomatic delegation from Constantinople. You watch their eyes try to take in the immensity of the great mosque. They nod approvingly to each other, and you feel a sense of pride as they pass you by, heading towards the gates of the royal palace. This is where the royal palace was. It's no longer here. Today it's the Alcázar, built in the 14th century. But these beautiful gardens are a memory of those warm autumn nights of wine and music, slave girls singing and wise men reciting poetry. Hang on, did I just mention poetry and slavery in the same sentence? Why, yes, I did. And here's why. There's a lot to admire 
about Andalusia society at this time. The lamplit streets, the fountains, the gardens, the hundreds of libraries preserving the wealth of the world's knowledge. But let's not forget that it was still a medieval society. The fairy tale world of a thousand and one nights was the very real world of jihad and slave trading. It's not a point that needs to be drummed in, it's just part of the landscape. But it's something to keep in mind because you sometimes see slavery portrayed as an exclusively Arab endeavor. Slaves were traded across the medieval world. Al-Andalus imported slaves predominantly from Central Europe, generally for domestic, military, and administrative roles. Roles in which capable men rose through the bureaucratic and military ranks and intelligent women of the harem were educated in astronomy and literature and became the mothers of caliphs. I don't need to explain what's going on there. On the flip side, Moors or Saracens as they were called made popular slaves outside of Al-Andalus. The entire population of Arabic Minorca was enslaved by the Kingdom of Aragon. There was no earthly paradise in medieval Europe, but that didn't stop them trying to make it. This is where Andalusi literary culture found its voice, in starry gardens and fragrant nights. And not just in Arabic, but in Hebrew too. For young Cordobans, the language of God was also the language of love of lust, of grief, and of life. On the northern frontier, God drove men to murder and mayhem. But here, in the vast libraries and peaceful gardens of Cordoba, God inspired men to muse and meditate, and produce some of the most beautiful and timeless poetry ever written. And even when it all inevitably fell apart and exiled Andalusi scattered across the world, they carried their love of language with them, preserving a memory, a fleeting moment in time, a garden, a fountain, the smell of jasmine in the evening, and the heart unleashed. delegation met the Caliph that summer in 949, they gifted him an original Greek manuscript of Dioscorides on medicine. It was a priceless gift to a society that valued knowledge above gold and spices. The Greek catalogue had already been translated into Arabic, but in Baghdad, Europe had some serious catching up to do. So a second wave of translations began in the libraries of Cordoba. Greek manuscripts were sent from Constantinople along with monks to work alongside the Andalusi scholars. At the same time, Roman craftsmen, mosaicists, came to work on the ever-expanding mosque and the luxurious palatial city of Madinat al-Zara, rivaled only by the royal palaces of Baghdad and Constantinople. Now, there's little left. It was built to be the center of the world, but what that world should look like, well, that's a question we're still fighting over.
The Christians love to read the poems and romances of the Arabs. They study the Arab theologians and philosophers, not to refute them, but to form a correct and elegant Arabic. Where is the layman who now reads the Latin commentaries on the Holy Scriptures, or who studies the Gospels, prophets or apostles? Alas, all talented young Christians read and study with enthusiasm the Arab books. They gather immense libraries at great expense. They despise the Christian literature as unworthy of attention. They have forgotten their own language. For every one who can write a letter in Latin to a friend, there are a thousand who can express themselves in Arabic with elegance and write better poems in this language than the Arabs themselves. It's a Wednesday morning in June, 851. Outside the mosque, a crowd is being parted by some guards. The caliph is passing through the city. You squeeze yourself up against a building as people move to clear the street, bowing as the royal entourage passes. You turn to keep going, but then a voice shouts out. Muhammad is a liar and filled with the demon. A roar goes up all around you, and a scuffle breaks out. You catch a glimpse of a young monk forced to his knees in front of the caliph. The caliph strikes the monk across the face. Are you drunk? The crowd is silent. The monk lifts his face, his burst lip bubbling with blood. He is looking the caliph dead in the eyes and says, I am not drunk. I burn with the zeal of religious justice against you and your false prophet, and I do not fear death, for I will be welcome in the kingdom of heaven. For an instant, time stops. You decide to get out of here. By the end of the week, seven more radicals publicly denounced the prophet. All were publicly executed. But the martyrs kept coming, inspired by the writings of a monk called Eulogius. A cult of self-sacrifice grew around him as he sat in his monastery in the mountains outside Cordoba, exalting and immortalizing his followers who went down into the city to seek their death. The following year, the Caliph convened a council of the bishops to try and put an end to it all, an end which only came in 859 with the execution of Eulogius himself. He was the last of 48 who became known as the Martyrs of Cordoba. And nobody was impressed, the Christians least of all. To them, these martyrs who claimed to speak in the name of all Christianity were nothing but fanatics who put the whole community at risk of reprisals. But reprisals never came. The martyrs were dealt with efficiently, and everybody just got on with their life. Nobody wanted to upset the status quo. It was a house of cards relying on the social cohesion and strong government to keep it up. If one of these slipped, the whole thing would come crashing down. And it did, fast. If you know anything about the decline of the Roman Empire, this may sound familiar. Caliph al-Hakam dies in 976, leaving his teenage heir Hisham II to be dominated by a powerful general, al-Mansur. Al-Mansur migrates thousands of North African warriors, Berbers, to comprise the bulk of his army. They were despised and mistrusted by the civilized and unmilitaristic Andalusi, and in return, the Berbers develop a healthy hatred for their unwelcoming hosts. The army was effective, but expensive. To justify the high taxes, Al-Mansur doubles down on religious zealotry, making his whole raison d'etre permanent jihad against the northern kingdoms. This keeps the borders secure and the troops out of the cities. Great. Al-Mansur dies, leaving his party animal son in charge. Not great. But he doesn't last long and is succeeded by his brother Sanchuello, named for his maternal grandfather, King Sancho of Pamplona. Sanchuelo completely relies on the Berbers for his power, and by now the Andalusi are fed up with them, so they revolt and force Caliph Hisham, yes, he's still alive, to abdicate in favour of Al Mahdi, kicking off a civil war. Al Mahdi realises he doesn't have an army, so he abandons Cordoba to the Berbers who declare a new Caliph. But Al Mahdi knows where he can buy an army, and he returns six months later with an army of Christian mercenaries and retakes the city. He is quickly deposed and replaced with Hisham II. The Berbers return and after three years of siege, the city capitulates, Hisham II disappears, and the Berbers are unrestrained in their destruction. And Cordoba, the center of the world, lies ruined. Where P.
peace once reigned, fearful chasms yawned. Wolves resorted there, ghosts frolicked, demons sported. Wild beasts now lurked where men like lions, abundant in wealth and every luxury, once paid court to statuesque maidens, who were all now scattered and dispersed to the four corners of the earth. It's 1013. 40 years ago, Cordoba was second only to Constantinople. Now, it's a deserted smoking ruin. Once somewhere in this maze of ruins, there was a green onyx fountain decorated with elaborate human figures, a gift from the emperor of the Romans. There was a zoo, a living encyclopedia of all the weird and wonderful beasts on God's earth. But more than important than any of these, there were libraries. This was a culture that understood the pricelessness of knowledge, and they built hundreds of libraries. The Caliphal Library alone held 400,000 volumes. History, medicine, philosophy, natural sciences, poetry. Centuries of lives lived, millions of thoughts, ideas, decades of transcribing, copying, lost, turned to ash. This goes beyond mere wartime looting. The utter destruction of Madinat al-Zahra, the embodiment of Umayyad aspirations and glory, suggests a very different kind of destruction. This was deliberate and absolute deletion of everything the Caliphate stood for, everything the Berbers stood against. To them, the Umayyads were weak, impious, and unworthy of calling themselves caliphs. This period is sometimes called the Berber Wars, but more fitting is the term Arab historians use, the fitna, meaning a time of civil strife, of distress, of trouble. The world had no center anymore. Now, it was every man for himself. What happens next? is truly fascinating. Nothing again matched the singular golden age of Caliphal Cordoba. Instead, there were dozens of little golden ages, short-lived but significant. These were the Taifa kingdoms, small independent city-states or principalities scrambling to survive against each other and the expanding northern kingdoms of Castile, Leon and Aragon. Many of the great Andalusian philosophers and scientists emerged from this period of instability and uncertainty. In many ways, the rules no longer applied. But if this period shows us anything, it's that the black and white narrative of constant war between the Christians on one side and Muslims on the other is a complete fabrication. Far from being an era of constant jihad or crusade, it was an era of Machiavellian real politic. Look, this is Spain in 950, and this is Spain in 1031. And this map only shows the main Taifa states. There were dozens of smaller ones, sometimes only lasting a couple of years. Cordoba remained independent until 1070 as a sort of Medici-style, Florentine-esque republic, but not really state offering asylum to the rulers of smaller taifas that had been swallowed up by expansionist Seville until inevitably Cordoba II was absorbed by its rival city. Seville was the cultural successor to Cordoba, the most powerful of the taifas. But Cordoba was still the spiritual capital of Al-Andalus. Walking around, it was a shadow of its former self. Old established families continued to live here as if in protest to their growing irrelevance. Its schools still produced the likes of Averroes, Maimonides, two of the greatest thinkers of the medieval age, but neither would live out their adult lives here in a city that was more of a memory capsule than a living, breathing metropolis. But a city it still was, and an Andalusi city at that. You see, the animosity between the Berbers and the Andalusi hadn't faded. But with time, the Berbers tribes came to more resemble their Andalusi neighbours than the austere, militant tribesmen they arrived as. Nevertheless, wars were frequent. 
they were really just glorified skirmishes. Taifa armies were very small, little more than raiding parties, and generals relied heavily on mercenaries from the northern kingdoms, one of whom was Charlton Heston, I'm sorry, Diego Rodriguez, El Cid. The collapse of the caliphate balanced the scales between the north and the south, and the northern kingdoms could have easily overpowered the divided Taifas if they hadn't also been busy fighting amongst themselves. Fernandez Moreira calls the Taifa states petty and tyrannical kingdoms, which is fair enough, but there's no way that the northern kingdoms weren't just as petty and tyrannical. In his eyes, however, the northern kingdoms presented a solid front to the Andalusi, united in their predestined mission to rule over all of Spain, and presumably by extension half the globe. In reality, as often as the northern kingdoms were allied against the taifas, they allied with the various taifas against each other. Spain was a giant chessboard with a dozen different colored sets, all moving simultaneously and everyone was cheating. Gradually though, the frontier crept ever southwards. The taifa kings could feel which way the wind was blowing. Finally, the strongest of the taifas, Seville, bit the bullet and sent a letter to Morocco. Somewhere deep in the high atlas, in a simple tent of cloth and canvas, a man presses his forehead into the earth. He prays for strength and conviction. Can he truly follow in the footsteps of the prophet? The mountains breathe hot desert air, slapping the tent like a drum. Far away, an eagle cries. He raises his head. God has answered. Rising, he emerges into the midday sun. Several hundred men kneel before him, waiting. A pause. Then, unsheathing his sword, he flashes its gleaming face in the sun. A roar echoes through the valley, the thundering of hooves, a storm descending into the plain. The Almoravids ride in Marrakesh. The Almoravids were a conquest polity. They required constant expansion to sustain their coffers and their legitimacy. If its leaders could not provide booty for the troops and protection from their enemies, their power would be undermined. The movement began as a religious revival, as a jihad against injustice, as they perceived that to be, and a determination to spread righteousness and abolish taxation. That last one was very popular, as I'm sure you can imagine. By 1083, the Almoravids had conquered Morocco, and in 1085, King Alfonso of Castile entered Toledo in triumph. Looking to his left and his right, Al-Mutamid of Seville decided on the lesser of two evils and invited the Almoravids to Al-Andalus. In his words, better to pasture camels than be a swineherd. The Almoravids came and utterly shattered the Castilians. But whilst these fearsome veiled warriors made good soldiers, they made poor governors. Constant revolts in Morocco meant that the Almoravid leaders could never designate any more resources to Al-Andalus than the bare minimum required to maintain the northern frontier. At the same time, their fundamentalist Islamic regime proved unpopular with the Andalusi lay people. Many Jews chose to migrate north, and in the north, the Kingdom of Aragon renewed its offensive. The Zaragoza fell, and Christian knights rode around Cordoba, burning fields and ransacking villages. The Almoravids were in trouble in Spain, but also in Morocco. A new religious warrior faction had emerged from the mountains, calling themselves the al Mohad. They were like the Almoravids, only more fanatical. You noticing the pattern here? Back in Spain, the Almoravids were only tolerated so long as they could hold off the northern knights. And now that they couldn't, the Andalusi saw no reason to keep them around. Cordoba revolted in 1145, expelling the Almoravids, who by this stage had no home to go to, because the Almohads had taken Morocco. The Almoravids were out, the Almohads were in. The purification began been likened to Stalin's purges. Maimonides, the greatest Jewish scholar, the second Moses, fled Cordoba to escape the persecutions. 
his contemporary, Ibn Rushd, heard whilst in exile of the public burning of his works. Ibn Rushd was held in high regard by the Almohad Caliph, and he tried to shelter the Andalusian philosopher, but even the commander of the faithful had to yield to popular pressure. It's as if, in the panic to stall the onslaught of its impending demise, the very keystones of what made Al-Andalus great were being dug up and hurled into the breach. The scholar and the Sufi had no place in this age of ideology and fear. Rain batters the high stone walls. The night is dark, the city subdued under a blanket of cloud. Outside the walls, the fires of the besieging army are petering out. Only a fool would venture out on a night like this. Fools and the brave. Step by step, a knight heaves his way up the vertical face of a tower. Behind him, a dozen more ascend, clinging to a rope, shrouded in the moonless night. They reach the top. They're in. Then, with an almighty roar, they burst across the ramparts. Twelve men sound like a hundred. One waves a torch from atop the battlements, and two more throw open the gates, and the night is filled with fire and screaming as the army floods through the archway. Cordoba is fallen. And that's it. Ferdinand entered the ancient city, entered the great mosque and prayed. It was 1236. In 1248, he took Seville and that's where he is to this day. The inscription on his tomb is written in Latin, Castilian and Arabic. Beaten, yes, but never forgotten. In order to take Cordoba, Ferdinand had made a deal with one of the resurgent Taifa kingdoms, a recognition of sovereignty in return for military assistance. That Taifa was Granada, and it would persevere for another two centuries, the last bastion of Al-Andalus. But eventually Granada fell too, surrendered by the last emir to the Catholic monarchs. And as Ferdinand and Isabella began ascending those thousand steps to the gates of the Alhambra, three Spanish ships were sailing west. It was 1492. And everybody knows what happens next. Jewish expulsion, the Inquisition, global empire. But Cordoba had no part to play in this new world. It had been the center of the old one for so long, I think in a way it welcomed some time on the sidelines. There's a beautiful poem written by Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, a 13th century Andalusian Sufi. She is a bishopess one of the daughters of Rome. Unadorned, thou seest in her a radiant goddess. Wild is she. None can make her his friend. She has gotten in her solitary chamber a mausoleum for remembrance. A mausoleum for remembrance. Cordoba slipped quietly into irrelevance, but never irreverence. And indeed, none could make her his friend. So many lives lived, Spanish, Arabs, Goths, Romans. Who can honestly say this city is ours? And yet some do. Some believe that they and they alone can possess this city, that their history entitles them to it. And if allowed, they will erase the parts of that history that don't conform to their worldview. That's what's at stake. Look, history is just the story of dead people. It doesn't define us. We don't have to do the same things they did. We have that choice, but that's why it's so important that we don't go changing history, that we preserve it all in its entirety, so that we can identify the patterns that keep popping up again and again, and maybe, just maybe, use that knowledge to build a better world. The city is probably laughing at us, it's seen it all. The fact is, this city has stood here for millennia. It'll stand here for a millennia more. And we'll probably stand here until the very end. Maybe on that day, we'll realize what it stands for. Okay.